thanks for being patient, guys. I'm Orv, W6BI. All digital all the time. Anyway, we're going to talk about data rates for ham radio digital modes. Um, I'm talking about modulation rates, not throughput. For those of us who are an age old enough to remember dial-up modems, you know that a 56K modem didn't give you 56K. It's the same deal with all of these. Packet radio, the grand old man, is 1200 baud, works out to be 0 0.0012 megabits per second in modern terms. Um, <laughs> it wasn't very fast uh, 40 years ago, and it hasn't improved any. Uh, Pactor 4, somewhere between 15 and 12, 25 kilobits per second, assuming good band conditions. VARA, which is a software modem, um, the FM version of which is used for Windank, Winlink, can do up to 25 kilobits per second with the right gear. And the Arden ham radio links can be over 100 megabits per second. Now remember, that's just modulation rate, not end-to-end -end throughput. So I'm gonna talk about the software bit, then we'll talk about hardware and applications and stuff like that. So um, a lot of hams aren't up to speed with the intimate details of networking. So the Arden folks put in a DNS server, a DHCP server. Uh, the software does node discovery and it figures out how to get to them. So you get routing information and it creates a ham radio TCP network, uh, an internet with a lowercase i. Uh, this makes it a lot easier to get this stuff going because you don't have to worry about BGP tables and stuff like that. Um, for those of you um, in an RF black hole, uh, with no direct RF link to the network, the uh, nodes will tunnel to them between themselves over the internet. I kind of call that the Arden starter kit. Um, and there's no hacking required. You can use off-the-shelf hardware now, and that, that makes the entry easier. And they support four brands of equipment. I think it's four. I lose count. 100, over 100 different models across four different handbands. The little star there says um, they've been supporting equipment for a long time, and a lot of it is older, like two generations back. They support it. We don't recommend it anymore. It's like, you know, driving a, I don't know, a 71 Falcon around. You could, but why would you want to? Um, and for the last few years, you can do over-the-air software updates. No uh, driving up a muddy road to a hilltop and uh, updating a piece of hardware. So the Arden nodes, and they're called nodes after they're uh, updated, are typically about 600 milliwatts. They're low power. And they are strictly line of sight at these SHF microwave frequencies. So as a result, just like when you have a handy talkie, uh, you talk through a hilltop radio site. With a handy talkie, it's a repeater. With one of these Arden nodes, it's another Arden node. And because of the routing uh, protocol, it always will choose the best route, uh, the strongest route, best SNR. Uh, so there's no point in using an omni antenna. We recommend directional antennas. So you've got this awesome infrastructure, this network, but it doesn't do anything. It's all about getting to the services. And the services are things you can actually use. And you can see them there, keyboard, email, video, all of those, plus file sharing, web servers, repeater linking, games, and pretty much anything else you can think of subject to the Part 97 regulations. Um, here's some examples of some services. Um, we've used all of these here. We're not necessarily using all of them now, but we've tried them all. Um, if you've ever been on a Slack channel, Mattermost and Rocket Chat are two of the open source wannabes, uh, clones. Uh, we happen to use Mattermost. And they can support text and pictures uh, and multiple channels for different topics and subjects. And uh, they have a web server and an application uh, for pretty much any uh, OS out there. Uh, this is getting old. Uh, this is an old screenshot of one of our Mattermost servers, Eric, KG6WXC, who manages it, happened to be out camping in the high desert of California uh, with his uh, wife and daughter the uh, day of the 7.1 Ridgecrest earthquake. Now, they were in a tent on the flat. 
they got bounced around a lot, but no harm. Uh, pretty exciting. Uh, the next day, Eric drove over and took a picture of the surface rupture. Now, there's Part 15 wireless out in the high desert, but there's no Arden. So how did he get it to us? Um, turns out he runs two Mattermost servers, one on our mesh network and one on the Part 15 network. So he was able to use the Mattermost app in his phone and send this picture to us. It's pretty handy. It's really good. Um, VoIP, voice over IP with phones. Uh, this is an old picture. This is before we even deployed. Um, old cost, uh, old uh, Cisco phone on the left I got off eBay. Um, and the network admin I was working with at the time was not up to speed on Linux. He's doing better, but you know, not ready for uh, messing around with asterisk. So he bought this off the shelf uh, VoIP PBX from Grandstream. You know, it's a low end, it'll only support, I don't know, 32 simultaneous conversations, 256, more than we ever need. Um, and here's a Grandstream phone, which we recommended for our PBX because it's easier to manage. Um, and if you can see it up close there, it says I missed a call. And if this was video, you'd see the red light blinking that I had a uh, voicemail. So these PBXs support pretty much everything you'd expect out of a commercial PBX, well, because they are, you know, call waiting, um, uh, call forwarding, uh, conference bridges. We have a couple of those set up. So it's pretty slick. Um, here's a picture of the, the PBX in a repeater rack on top of Sulphur Mountain. Um, just to show you that it does live up there. Um, collaboration servers are like uh, what you see the gamers use to keep uh, in uh, contact with their teams on movies and TV. Um, TeamSpeak, Mumble, and TeamTalk are a lot of the open source versions. They all have voice and video chat, file sharing, desktop sharing, and I'm sure there's other features on various ones. We chose TeamTalk. Um, they all support speaker microphone on your laptop or like a USB headset. Um, it's full duplex, and which is not like a repeater. You can, <laughs> you can interrupt the person who's talking on endlessly, and you have more of a realistic conversation that way. And if you have multiple channels, you can have multiple simultaneous full duplex conversations. And this is not your father's, or in some cases, grandfather's FM repeater. It is not communications grade audio. Um, typically, the link uh, connections are good enough to where the codecs shift to their highest um, performance and you get very high quality uh, audio. We have a, a, a voice net on a TeamTalk server on the Arden network every Wednesday. And I will uh, close the doors in the office, uh, put my headset on. Uh, put it on uh, uh, Vox and put my feet up on the couch, uh, on the on the desk here and just have a great conversation. Very natural sounding. This afternoon, I was feeling wildly because I I'd actually been setting up longer than I should have been because I wanted to see some shows. And I got stupid. Are they talking to me or is that just somebody talking in the background? Oh, okay. Um, uh, here's a picture of the uh, a screenshot of the Team Talk client. And uh, on the left, you can see everybody was logged in. When somebody's talking, keyed up an audio uh, coming across, uh, their background is green, so you know who's talking. When they're done talking, it turns yellow. So you can see here that Dave Cam 6 fq was the last one to talk. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see a couple of extra channels that I named aux channel one, aux channel two, just, just because, I mean, they could be uh, base camp and uh, fire camp two and, or something like that. If uh, two of the members wanted to talk privately, they could double click on one of those channels, go off and talk privately while everybody else is in the main channel. When they were done, they can click at the top level uh, up here at the top and return to the main channel. We have uh, chat, video, desktops, and files. And you can see I'm logged into the chat uh, a channel or a tab. And here's the video tab. Um, let me go back. We don't find that video adds a lot to a net. Um, it's good for showing things to people. 
uh, but it uses a lot of bandwidth. Um, these, uh, but one, once in a while, we have everybody fire up their uh, uh, webcams and see how the server, the Team Talk server, and the network handle it. Uh, at this point in time, we had for this particular test, we had seven video streams running, and these are 640 by 480 uh, video windows there, and we run 10 to 15 frames per second. You don't need HD TV, um, and that worked out to be um, about 100 kilobits per second per, and you know that's 700 kilobits up, 700 kilobits down. I don't know one and a half megabits per second total. Um, and the backbone is good for five to seven megabits per second. And so you can see it can handle it. And the server is a Raspberry Pi 3. And while we were running this test, it has was about 10% CPU utilization and 10% network utilization. So it's pretty handy. It's a lot of fun. Um, cameras. Um, I'll talk about why we're using cameras, but here's a shot um, from Pismo Beach, one of our cameras up the coast. And this is one here in my valley. This happens to be a pan tilt zoom camera and um, it does a patrol. It moves, I don't know, to a designated uh, bearing every, I think 15 minutes or so. So you're always seeing a different view. There's, there's no point in viewing uh, a video camera when all you see is grass waving. So I take a screenshot from all of the cameras and post it on a web page that somebody can look at. That way they don't need to fuss with uh, uh, a video viewing software. We also have a couple security cameras. This is kind of handy. Uh, this particular building is on a uh, water tank site. And once in a while, you'll see a uh, technician's truck parked there servicing either the tanks or the scatter gear that's microwave up on top of the tank. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this. Back in 2016, the Arden code had matured enough to where we could start talking about a, building a real network. And Paul WD6EBY and I were building one across uh, Ventura County all through 2016 and part of 2017. And this particular site, which is on a, a private site on top of Sulphur Mountain, south of Ojai, um, was one of the sites and Paul had an old junker fixed focus, fixed direction camera and he threw on the network there um, just for fun. And in September of that year, um, another tech, uh, AWRL, uh, what do we call them? Technical specialist, uh, Ben AS6YR emailed me with a link to an article that showed how to stream video cameras to uh, to, you, uh, to YouTube, and he says, why don't you try getting this to work? We might need it sometime. So I messed around with the uh, a camera I had looking at my driveway at tests and mailed him a, a, a YouTube video while it was running. Thought that was cool and put the article away. And six or eight weeks later, the Thomas fire broke out near uh, Santa Paula, California. He pinged me right away because he's uh, big on emergency communications said, don't you have a camera up on Sulphur Mountain? Well, we do, but it was a different brand and model of camera. And I futzed around, did get it working. And we streamed video like this for about an hour and 45 minutes. We lost the link uh, before the fire came over the hill because it was a hot, windy uh, Santa Susana day, uh, very hot and gusty, uh, dry uh, winds we get here periodically. And one of the intermediate network sites went down because we hadn't set up backup power yet. So anyway, after the video went down, the fire came down, wiped out the owner's driveway. You can see by the light. Uh, the tower is about 100 yards south of the owner's property line. The fire came down, uh, turned west to the left, right at the owner's property line, continued west through the town of Ventura and wiped out hundreds of structures, hundreds. Uh, it was pretty bad. Um, a few days later, I got an email from a fire inspector from the Ventura County Fire Department asking for the URL of, of this video. And it was still up on YouTube. And I gave it to him and he thanked me. We never heard anything back directly, but we did hear in, indirectly 
that uh, they found it useful because this was the first video of the fire. So lesson learned from then on, we start work, working at hardening the network, expanding it and putting better cameras out. Um, that following June, uh, the County Board of Supervisors, as they do every June, declared it ham radio month. And in the proclamation, they specifically mentioned this video. So we got a, we got a lot of mileage out of this video. And we continued uh, adding at least battery backup, if not solar power, excuse me, and wouldn't you know it, the next year, uh, the Woolsey fire broke out. Um, this view is of Simi Valley, my hometown. The camera is, is on the north edge of the valley and you're looking southwest. The fire started in Woolsey Canyon about three or four screens off to the left. Another hot, windy, dry day. And matter of fact, my son and I actually saw the fire break out and it took off like a bandit. Um, and we were streaming video from this a pan tilt zoom camera to YouTube. And this time we did it for about, oh, I don't know, 36 hours. And we heard back from quite a few people who, who watched it off and on said they found the, the, the video uh, more uh, as useful as uh, uh, conventional media because it was immediate. The fire you can see there um, made a run down the hill towards the, the corner of the town, but the fire department fought it off. The fire turned around, the wind turned around, it went back up over the hill, down into the town of Thousand Oaks, wiped out hundreds of uh, hundreds of structures, continued south across the uh, 101 freeway, up and over the Santa Susana Mountains, back down through Malibu, took out hundreds of under structures and stopped at the Pacific Ocean. So for us here in Southern California, video is a very, very important part of our Arden network. There have been other smaller ones since then, nothing of this magnitude. Um, this one broke out uh, <laughs> at the base of the hill where the camera was at. This is, if you know the area, this is the Santa Susana Pass and that's the 118 freeway. If you look closely at the bottom center, you can see uh, members of the strike crew that a previous helicopter dropped off at the point. Uh, they knocked it down, it was just a few acres. Somebody threw a cigarette out of a car or something. So video for us is important. So the future of MCOM is not voice, but rather data, eventually. Um, if you've ever had to relay a handwritten list of obscure medicines over voice, it's slow and it's error prone. It would be so much easier if somebody would hand you, say, a, a thumb drive with a text file on it, say, here, send this. Uh, and there's good ways to do that, better ways. So I'm sure pretty much everybody here knows about WinLink, global radio email, originally for boaters. Started out with ALE, the automatic link establishment radios, the commercial radios that are, I understand, pretty pricey. Uh, picked up packet radio and now supports Pactor. Also supports Pactor or Vara HF. Um, which is in performance comes very close to uh, Pactor 4 in many instances and is substantially cheaper. A license for Vara HF is, I think, $69. If I didn't mention it already, it's a software modem. Um, on VHF, again, packet radio, APRS, which I did not know that, uh, Vara FM, and Arden networking, which is obviously not much faster. But the cool thing is you don't have to specify your digipeters. It knows the route to the post office. And if you're not familiar with WinLink, has a large set of messaging templates from the ICS, USGS, FEMA, and there are a lot of state-specific ones too. Um, I stole this from the WinLink site quite a few years ago. It may have been updated, but I updated it to the best of my knowledge. And you can see where VARA goes there and the and the Arden networking. I need to delete RDOP. It's 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 an older uh, software modem, uh, newer newer than Winmore, uh, but older than Var or older than Vara. Uh, it's not used a whole lot anymore, as far as I can tell. So here's the WinLink uh, email client. Uh, it's WinLink Express. Looks pretty much like any other email client. Um, the difference is. 
because it's not just going out over the internet, you you have to specify how you want to send it, if it's via packet or VAR HF or something like that. So the setup is a little more involved. Um, being that I run WinLink, you can specify which WinLink post office out on the network you want because they do advertise. And this is this is a screenshot, an older screenshot from a document I wrote and more on that. And this is an email I got from Jay today <laughs> saying he's gonna be here tonight and I saw him, hi Jay. Um, and you'll see here, this is the, uh, the, 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 the window that shows the transaction. And you can see, if you look down there, uh, bytes per minute, 413,000. Down lower, is bytes per minute, 65,13. So total ses session time, three seconds. So you can move a lot of traffic very quickly with WinLink on the Arden network. Um, there's other ways to send email. Um, you can use a standard email server um, configured for the mesh network. So it knows not to use the internet. Um, for clients, you can use any standard client. I use Thunderbird. Um, and there are web clients available. We're running RoundCube on ours. Uh, the good thing about it is uh, there's no attachment size limitation. You know you're going to be on a fairly high bandwidth uh, network. So you can run a two or three or four megabyte uh, style, size, size file. And if it's configured right, you can send and receive email to and from the internet. So here's my uh, Thunderbird client. You can see my plain old Gmail account at the top, but down here is my K6PVR-mail account with some email on it. And here's a picture of uh, RoundCube, which is the, the web-based uh, email client, and it, it works fine too. There's other things you can do with the network besides MCOM. Um, this is my uh, weather station. It happens to be a Pete Brothers, an older one that does not have a web-based interface. It's uh, uh, an LCD screen and a serial port. So I take the serial port, convert it to USB and plug it into a computer and I run WeWX. I'm not sure if it's WeWX or we, we Weather. Um, uh, it supports I don't know, two or three different operating systems and hundreds, if not thousands of weather station models and temperature sensors. They keep adding to it. Um, this is um, yesterday, and this is the week, weekly view showing that we've got some rain. Um, Dave, A uh, AI6VX has his homebrew uh, seismometer uh, on the network. Um, we get to watch uh, earthquakes and stuff like that. He's across the county. And it's not all about MCOM and emergency. We've played with a Scrabble server. We've played with a tank server. It's kind of fun. I'm terrible at it, but uh, uh, very good reaction times too. And once in a while after a net, we'll have a few hands of poker. Um, let's talk about the hardware um, that it, that is used, is supported by Arden. Um, it's mostly designed for outdoor use. There's a specific exception. I'll talk about that. Um, and being such, it's weatherproof and it runs PoE, uh, power over Ethernet, so you don't have to run a separate power cable up there. And guys, I'm amazed we get the complex hardware we get for so cheap. These things are amazing. <clears throat> and unlike the older generation wireless, these are MIMO, multiple input, multiple output. We run two channels, and I'll talk about that. And almost all of them, well, a lot of them have built-in gain antennas, one for each channel. And I'm no longer recommending the, we're now calling them legacy devices, the older 802.11n. For one thing, the, the newer 802.11ac devices aren't much more expensive and they're the usual newer, faster, softer, better, softer, <laughs> faster, better. Um, and uh, uh, those are the ones I'm going to be talking about. I'm not showing into the older gear. And by the way, uh, the manufacturers are not building much of the older 802.11n only gear. The 802.11ac gear will run 802.11n. And now that we support it, uh, that's the way to go. 
So here's a Microtech SXT. This thing's about, I don't know, eight inches square uh, for 5.8 gigahertz. And by the way, there was very little two gigahertz uh, stuff around anymore because we only have one usable channel, whereas on uh, five gigs, we've got about 30. So this will get you out to 10 to 12 miles, assuming line of sight. I don't know, it's, it's 80 bucks or something. Um, just a heads up, if you decide to buy one of these, uh, buy one of the mass clamps. If you just buy the radio, the radio, you get what's in the lower left and you get to clamp it with a hose clamp on the side of a post. That's great if you don't need any elevation, but uh, um, this little cheapy uh, plastic clamp here, I think is $3 or $6, something like that. If you need to reach out and smack somebody, you know, 20 or 25 miles away, you'd want one of these. Um, the 23 dBi gain here is about 75 or 80 bucks. And this one on the left, uh, 19 dBi is about 110. Why is it more? Because it has two ethernet ports on it. And there are, there are times when you want two ethernet ports. And if you really want to reach out and hit somebody, uh, the Powerbeam AC500, 25 dBi gain, and these two Microtech dishes, the medium and the large, have higher gain also. By the way, this AC500, 500 means 500 millimeters in diameter. The, um, this one's a metal dish, obviously, and the Microtech uses, a, a, I don't know, chicken wire, or the, a plastic hex with some metal grid in front of it. And the guys who are backfitting Arden into their go kits like these because not only are they lighter, there's less wind resistance. So for those of you who live in an HOA, um, you can put a Microtech light dish feed at the feed point of an old satellite dish and clamp it down with an $8 a universal LNB clamp from uh, Amazon and get out that way. This is 23 to 25 dBi gain, I guess. And the nice thing about it is your neighbors will never notice that you're Satellite dish is not pointing at a synchronous satellite. So the, the, the Arden gear is made to operate in the 10.0.0.0 network and it's hard coded. It has to be for various technical reasons. And that makes it hard to integrate into your home network, which is typically 192, 168 dot something. So the Arden guys took these Microtech HAPS home access point and adapted their code to it. And it lets you nicely integrate your home network with the with the Arden network. Uh, and, and before anybody asks, yes, it's firewalled off. They have a good set of firewall rules in it. And you can see, um, say your computer here is your shack computer. Uh, this app will know enough to want, if you want to go to amazon.com, it'll ship out your stuff to your home network on WAN 1, port 1. But if you want to go to the mesh network, it will go out to your outside node and link to the network. Uh, this is pretty much the first thing anybody buys or second. This is the older HAP AC light. We're not recommending this. It's a previous generation, uh, but you can see it's a five port router. Um, the newer ones here are also five port routers that have AC2 and the AC3, which is half again as large. Um, I didn't mention it, showed it in the graphic previously, but um, they all have two internal radios, a two gig and a five gig, which can be used for part 15 or, excuse me, the Arden network. Obviously, um, if you're gonna use it around the, around the house um, for part 15 access to your part 97 network, uh, you'd want the one with the, with the external antennas. Um, these have come down, they're about a hundred bucks now. So there's my Arden network, not very impressive, up about 30 feet on, on my uh, tower, it's a nano beam. Um, this is N6IMF over in the San Fernando Valley. Why does he have two of them? Well, he his link is to uh, Verdugo Peak, which is six or eight miles away from him. But he has a friend who's in the shadow, right at the foot of Verdugo Peak and can't hook to it. So uh, Mike takes in the link from Verdugo Peak and pushes it out on the second one on a different channel to his friend. I didn't mention it, but the nano station here has two ethernet ports. The cable from uh, your shack comes up into the port one with power and uh, DTD, which is the node to node protocol, loops out and powers this one. So got two nodes on the tower, and but only one wire, very handy.
I think this belongs to Dave, KN6KOO. He's uh, up in the Bay Area in their peninsula. Um, his access to their backbone up there is via this dish, goes uh, across the bay and it gets a good signal there. And he sends it, resends it out via this antenna to his neighbors, his local buddies. This is that sector antenna I talk about. Um, a number of the devices I've shown you now, um, just like a Baofeng, wouldn't be appropriate for production use on a hilltop. Um, typically, this is what you'll find in use on a hilltop. Um, it's a sector antenna, so-called because it covers so many degrees of the antenna compass. Um, this happens to be a 120 degree sector antenna. And actually within it, there's a 120 degree vertically polarized antenna and a 120 degree horizontally polarized antenna. Um, and you can see the two SMA jumpers going down to the radio on the back, which has the two transceivers in it driving them. That's a uh, ubiquity rocket, very popular. Uh, these are the Microtech uh, versions, Microtech Antenna Box 15S and 19S, 15 dB gain. Excuse me, 19 dBi gain. The cool thing about the 15 is the radio is internal. There's enough room there for it. With a 19, you'd have to clamp it to the mast on the back, which is not a big deal, but still cool. So here's a site, a uh, typical small site. This is in North Orange County. It's looking south, I believe. It's got a 2 gig, 3 gig, and a 5 gig, 120 degree sector antenna, all tied together with a, uh, a network switch. Um, it's about a half mile hike off of the nearest dirt road. Uh, so it's battery powered. The batteries and solar panels are behind us and that's how he powers them. And he's got a nice big pan tilt zoom camera here for watching fires and stuff like that. Um, believe it or not, this is not all Arden gear. Um, this is the Darn site, Darn, Darn 4 on Verdugo Peak. Darn is the Disaster Area Radio Network, I think. And they've been very, very accommodating letting us ride our Arden traffic through their existing microwave network. Um, the two dishes on the uh, telephone pole point to do two different mountains in uh, uh, Southern California. Darn has 46 repeaters on 26 sites or something like that. In any case, um, uh, three of these sector antennas are for Arden. One's a two gig pointing west, a five gig pointing west, and there's a five gig pointing south. The big dish is our 10 gig link. Um, it works fine. It's not into production yet for various reasons, but it'll. it's currently passing, uh, it's either 1.2 or 1.6 gigabits per second over a 47 mile link. And we're going to move all of our local traffic through that as a backbone, not just Arden, but if anybody needs it for DMR or anything like that, there's plenty of bandwidth. One day we hope to run this 10 gig link from the Bay Area down to the Mexican border. That's a multi-year project. And obviously this is not a small site. This is a commercial site on Pleasant's Peak in Orange County. Um, the owner is ham radio friendly and one of the uh, earlier developers of the Arden code, software coder, uh, was friends with him. And he's put this gear up here with the, the stuff with pointing at it with the yellow arrows. What you don't see below the camera are three or four dish antennas pointing at different direction, directions, linking various parts of the network together. So this is a major hub for Southern California. So um, I should have put this later. Um, there was a recent development, um, it's called a super node. It's a, it's a specially configured version of the Arden code that allows us to link various Arden networks together. <clears throat> and this is the link of the Arden, this is the picture of the Arden nodes as they stand right now. It's only been in existence for three or four months, but this is all of them. Um, there are, oops, in that picture, there are about 2000 nodes. Uh, and the color code tells you what they are. Um, I don't know if I have any information on the map or not. If you're interested, let me know. Uh, and that lets us um, do things like this. The mapper pulls information out of each node. There's a, a, a JSON file, which is a fancy text file, 
having has all sorts of vital information about the node. Uh, brand of hardware, model of hardware, version of software, how long it's been up, how much RAM it's using, um, all of the all of the network connections it's connected to and their quality. And all of that goes into a database. And if the node has latitude and longitude installed, which most of them do now because it helps the software run better, he can place them on a map. So this is uh, the Washington, Oregon area. You can see they have a pretty well-developed map or network. Uh, Chad K7HAK has got, done a good job around the Yakima area. Um, you can't tell, but there are mountains around here and he's got pan tilt zoom cameras uh, on, on them. And he's uh, recorded more than, more than one brush fire. Here's the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, why do we keep doing that? Um, as you can see, they're rather densely populated. Um, they kind of grew without any network planning for a few years, but for the last 18 months or so, they're starting to put backbones in place and bringing a, a, a little clarity to the mess. And this is, I guess, kind of the big daddy, Southern California. Um, like I said, uh, a couple of the Arden developers live in Southern California, so we kind of got a head start on everybody else. Um, last time I counted, there were, well, that was a while ago. There's probably 500 nodes in this picture now, uh, ground level and hilltop. So where do you get Arden information? From the Arden website. There's a list of supported products, both legacy and the newer 802.11 AC. Um, you can get the software from there, both production release and nightly builds. And lately they've been quite active. Uh, there's a, a nightly build with a small incremental bump, a little tweak and peak every oh, two or three times a week, say. And a lot of us uh, jump on those and do testing. Uh, there's how-tos, uh, FAQs, and a really good set of documentation. It was a bit of a mess a couple of years ago, but Steve, AB7PA, has put his arms around it and organized it. Even if you're just mildly interested, I recommend you go to the docs and just look through what's available there. It's very well organized. And the website has forums with about 4,900 members. Um, there are forums about deployments, uh, uh, stuff like that. And there are regional forums. Um, some, some of the some of the more less populated states, a few of them still don't have a state forum, but places like California has, I don't know, six or eight forums from north to south. Uh, there's a Facebook group, unofficial. It's got 2,600 members, and there is a Slack com a community, Slack uh, workspace on our uh, Slack works workspace called Arden Community. Um, and that's really a good place to hang out. There's always people there to answer a question. There's other social media. There's Discord and Mattermost, Telegram. And there are a, lots, uh, a lot of Arden groups, regional groups on groups.io. I think I belong to 15 of them. It's silly. So also from me at orbsplace.net, I've got a beginner's guide PDF you can download and hand off to your friends who are vaguely interested in it. It's a uh, very short summary of what you've seen here. Um, and I have a PDF version of this presentation. Um, and rather than just pretty pictures, I've put all the words in it that you've heard here. So it's, it's uh, quite a bit longer. And also, uh, I wanted to point out that um, I have a document there on how to set up a, a, a WinLink computer to use the Arden network. So. Uh, somebody mentioned they'd be interested in that, so that's there. And there's some other useful links like uh, sites will let you calculate line of sight for your area to a mountaintop or something, uh, so you know whether you have a chance of talking to a node. Any questions? One question, does it support Wi-Fi 6 or maybe Wi-Fi 7 and 802.11.ax? Not yet. Here's the deal. Uh, we don't do 10 or 20 foot, you know, 100 megabit per second uh, links. Um, it turns out 802.11n and AC are the sweet spot for spanning 20 and 30 mile links. And, and just to point out, 
AX and the higher ones, part of the way they get their high, wide bandwidth is combining channels, you know, 80, 160, and I don't know what all else. Most of our channels are 10 megabits per second to keep the SNR up. And it's enough throughput for us. Okay. Is that, that's all the questions from in chat, yeah. Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, I, I would like to have a question if that's okay. Go for it. Um, my name is uh, Michael Kennedy. I'm in Ottawa, Canada, Victor Alpha 3, Tango Echo Charlie. Um, I, we also have a small Arden network here with a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Luke. His call is VA2RLM. Um, my main question is um, the super nodes. Um, how would we be able to possibly connect to a super node? And then what would be the bit rate through all the super nodes? And drop if it note. needs to be offline, we can do it offline. Well, drop me a note and I'll explain you how, explain now. Uh, the throughput uh, will be what the internet will support between them because it's all internet based. Right. Okay. Okay. So it depends on the connection at either end. Yeah, it, it, it the weakest link. But typically, you know, we see two guys have spectrum, you know, uh, one way will be fast and the other way will be slow because a spectrum is asymmetrical. You know, you get 300 megs down and 12 megs up. Yeah, okay. Um, and then I guess the IP trace would, would sort itself out with the... OLS RD um, networking mesh networking protocol. Yes. Uh, if if I'm under if I ask the question correctly. <laughs> yeah, all of the uh, IP addresses are self-assigned based on the MAC address. Oh, okay, okay. Because um, if they have to do um, you know IP reuse, but because uh, right now we would be a small island, you would be another island. And then if we to connect the two islands together, just make sure that we're not doing uh, IP reuse. But I guess that if that the system has already been well thought out, then yeah. Okay, no, that's perfect. You answered my questions. You're very welcome. Drop me a note and we'll talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you. Oh, it's hey, Dan. Or can you uh, repost the PDF location? Yeah, I'll put it right here. Uh. <laughs> Let me confirm it first. Hang on. Uh, okay. Um, so if I go to your website, um, the orbs uh, dot net, um, then I can just your email would be there. Uh, hang on a second here. I I can't type and talk. <laughs> okay. No problem. No problem. We'll get you in just a second, Dan. Yeah, here we go. Let me paste this in everyone. There. Okay, great. Dan, you had a question. W7COO. I, I always have lots of questions, <clears throat> but hi, Orf. In hi, Dan. specific, is the super node, <clears throat> excuse me, um, not the super node, but the super network. Come on, I'm having a brain fart for the words. The 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 formal name for it, which is stupid, is cloud mesh. Okay, well that that so that even elaborates on what I was thinking. And presumably, that is intended to eliminate the birthday paradox problem with the address assignments based on serial numbers of the devices? No, um, there really isn't a problem with um, uh, <clears throat> duplicates because the uh, MAC addresses are unique and the algorithm derives a unique uh, IP address from the MAC address. Um, the main impetus <laughs> uh, for creating the super nodes, according to Tim KN6PLV, the coder, he wants small, this is his excuse. 
He wants small networks to see what kind of services are out there on the larger uh, networks to give them ideas. But honestly, I think he just thought it would be neat. Clearly, it's neat. And so it's still using just IPv4, right? It's using IB, IPB, IPv4. Um, there's there's no plans to go to IPv6 um, since we're using the 10 network. Uh, um, we may end up looking at uh, a 44 net um, for backbones and stuff like that, but I haven't seen any formal discussion. Uh, by the way, I don't speak for the devs. I talk to them a lot, but I don't speak for them. Um, you mentioned tunnels. <coughs> the <laughs> the the legacy tunnel. Yeah, hang on a second, Tom. The legacy tunnels were quite an old technology, and they were using TCP tunnels over TCP, which is a bad idea. Um, the new tunnels are WireGuard tunnels, which is an open source VPN that's basically the go-to VPN now. It's replacing op uh, open VPN and stuff like that. And it works very well. It's solid code. It's easy to use. And uh, in some cases can be faster. Um, I have spent the last three days converting two dozen tunnels uh, over you know, from, from the legacy to WireGuard. And that's the way to go. If you're tunneling with anybody, uh, get on the latest uh, uh, nightly build and convert it to WireGuard. You won't regret it. Okay. And, and um, last point, I have a historical point. In May of 2015, one could, if you knew, if you could reach a gateway on, on your mesh island, you could integrate WinLink with Arden simply by selecting the Telnet mode of WinLink on a system isolated from the internet. And it's doing what the post offices are doing today, I think. Uh, that was before my time. Um, I would have to defer that answer to somebody else. Okay. And it, it's a phenomenal system. And like I said, it's been improving almost on a monthly basis. There's a lot of smart people working together. And um, it's got long legs for the future. I think so. Um, I think it, plus a standard email system uh, for a local area, running over Arden uh, would be great supplements to each other. Yeah, Cal OES was lusting after that uh, to provide access in fire camps for a while. Right. But... Hey, let's pick up Tom here real quick. Tom, come on in. The National Library of Medicine, uh, they had a disaster office and they had a piece of software that allowed you to write an email, but only through a uh, um, browser interface. And the purpose was to keep people from using their uh, faux stationary backgrounds and so forth that just didn't know how much bandwidth they were chewing up. Uh, but that's gone by the board because WinLink changed something and they lost their funding to continue changing the software. Is there anything equivalent that you know of out there that would, if you're helping people at a shelter, that would keep them from doing weird stuff uh, when they're just supposed to be getting email access to the system and nothing else? Well, if you're talking about WinLink Express, it's pretty much text-based. Right. But, you know, when a person has no idea how they're getting there, you know, a, a sheltery just doesn't and oh. doesn't need to understand. But part of their not understanding is they'll naturally try some things that are going to be a nuisance to the local system operator. So as far as you know, is there anything like that in terms of a web interface for just allowing emails or appropriate traffic into the network so that you don't have to sit there and uh, monitor them one by one. Well, I did mention RoundCube. That is a web-based email client that uh, we uh, uh, provide to users. They can log in 
uh, via that or via their home uh, uh, email app. And it's it's pretty much text. I mean, you can attach big files to it. I mean, you can't help people. I would say that's a local management issue. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Anybody else out there? Hands up. Put questions in chat. Barry, how are we looking? We're good in chat. I see lots of good information there for people who want to take a look at that. Um, I see your hands up. Or, or if anyone's interested and they saw uh, Steve's posting of the the maps of the nets, they're building down in the Florida Peninsula a huge Arden network, and we were able to link it up with Iowa. And eventually, we're going to have a nationwide backbone, like with super nodes. It's going to be absolutely amazing, and we're at the very early stages of this so it's going to be exciting to see yes uh, the super nodes are a lot of fun um but i just li like to point out that like dmr it's not real ham radio <laughs> when the internet goes down you need to make sure that any services you provide to a served agency don't depend on the internet i mean you're going to use rf links either hf or uh, if it's the arden network make sure it's all rf Mm hmm Very important. Okay. So, or has nobody suggested a super node or super tunnel just using um, Starlink? Mm, I don't know if enough, enough about Starlink to uh, comment. Okay. Um, the, 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 the super nodes handle a lot of traffic. Um, most of it's routing traffic uh, because there's, I don't know, somewhere it varies between 1,900 and 2,200 nodes that the super nodes know about. Um, so uh, I, 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 I think an internet link is pretty much expected. And a lot of the equipment, like the Ubiquity company, is actually having grants available for amateur radio groups, and they will give you incredible discounts on some of their equipment if if you prove it through an amateur radio group. So that's worth looking into golf. Good to know. But try not to accept 802.11n gear, please. Right, right. <laughs> we have some. We say we have some gear out there that's you know, ten or fifteen years old. It's awful. And 3.4 gigs gone by the way. Half of it. Well, I understand that, but for I, I, is anybody starting up with Arden on 3.4 gig links? No, but the existing links are staying. Okay. I have one running. I converted one to five gig, but I was going to do that anyway. Which is interesting because the um, those radios were. Um, actually five gig radios that they um, just transcribed down to three gig, I think, or 3.4 gig. Yeah, transverted, yeah. Um, and those that hardware is uh, quite an old vintage. That's at least two two generations back now. So I help time flies when you're having fun. Okay, anybody else? Questions, answers? Just a... Just a quick comment, Dan, and and folks. Uh, you mentioned Ubiquity having the opportunity to uh, donate gear to ham operators. Don't be afraid to reach out if you have a local wireless ISP, especially in the rural areas. A lot of times they're quickly updating their Ubiquity stuff and throwing their two and three year old Ubiquity routers in the trash because they don't know what to do with them. Well, I, I thought we just heard Orb say that there's <laughs> 80211 well, has gone away. What 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 I said was don't buy any new 80211N. If you're gifted it and that's what you need to get going, go ahead. It's no money out of your pocket. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's been a great presentation. I really appreciate this. Oh, happy to help. Okay. Well, there's no more questions, no more answers. No more Good. comments. Anybody got a comment out there? Yeah, I'm going to go eat my dinner now. Okay. 
He's going to go eat his dinner, so we're going to pull the plug, say 73s, and see you guys next week. Got Thank any you questions? All for coming. Uh, if yeah, if you want to join the uh, the uh, Arden community on Slack, drop me a note and I'll send you an invite. Okay. Would you do me a favor and send me your presentation tonight? Email it to me. Um, I can, um, but it doesn't have any words on it. You're better off pulling the PDF down out of up my web website. Okay. <laughs> I, I can send you the presentation, but a lot of the slides are just pictures. There's no narration. All right. Um, I'll do both. Just okay. remind me. I'll send you an email. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. For you talk, for you talk, Tom, for the tutorials, go to uh, the Mesh, the Arden Mesh website and the tutorials on there. All right. Ardenmesh.org. Oh. Arden yes. Also, uh, there's a lot of good stuff on YouTube. Just take a pass at the stuff that's older than about two years. The stuff changes quickly. Ben, you got your hand up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, thanks. I'd just like to uh, make mention to uh, Corey and, and uh, everyone there that's been doing uh, Arden. Uh, I've been retired from Cal OES now three years, so I'm a little out of the loop. But I can't speak for past that uh, the professionals uh, continue to support amateur radio at the highest level at the state of California. Uh, I was an assistant chief of tactical communications for Cal OES for almost 30 years. And we're continually uh, fighting bureaucracy, trying to uh, make sure that <clears throat> all of our amateur radio repeater sites and other um, areas are protected. And uh, we continue to uh, um, benefit from things like your live video shots uh, that many in CAL FIRE and CAL OES, uh, right down to the State Operations Center, uh, we would uh, constantly try to monitor and get some real-time information even prior to the uh, folks on the boots on the ground. So I appreciate all the work that you've been doing, Ori, uh, and everyone else out there that have been working diligently nationwide on emergency communications. Okay. I have a complaint, though. Your RV has no antennas on it. Um, well, that picture doesn't do justice, but I actually have a MORAD HF uh, uh, whip antenna and a uh, Diamond X3000, both of them with uh, Shakespeare ratchet, like a, uh, a yacht. This is a land yacht, so I can ratchet them down when I'm mobile. And they're up right now. In fact, I'm on a, on a uh, on two nets right now that I got to get back to. All right. Well, we'll let you slide this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dan. All right. Well, okay, everybody. I'm going to pull the plugs. A73. It's been another good one. Have a good weekend ahead of us here, folks. <laughs>